morning, D-Day Conniot, and welcome to World War II Armor's portion of our weapons demonstration. Uh, during World War II, tanks and armored vehicles carried a variety of larger caliber weapons on down to smaller caliber weapons for offense and defense. Today, we've got our armorer from World War II Armor, Matt Lambert, to talk to you a little bit more about our weapons. Morning, D-Day Conniot. We're going to go through some of the weapons here of uh, World War II Armor, and we'll show you what uh, we usually bring to our presentations. We'll start out with our M2 HB heavy barrel 50 caliber machine gun. This particular weapon was manufactured by AC Spark Plug, Division of General Motors. So uh, that actually shows a little bit of how the uh, manufacturing capabilities of the United States came together and all manufactured stuff for the war effort. So this one here is 50 caliber. It is live fire capable, but we do have it blank adapted for our, our presentations, obviously. Uh, this one here is mounted on our M3 uh, tripod, so this is in a basically an anti-infantry role here on the as a ground mount. Uh, this weapon is usually mounted on the uh, on our tanks here as a uh, anti-infantry slash anti-aircraft weapon uh, on any of our armored vehicles. Matt, what's a little bit more about this weapon's history? These guns are still in use today with the U.S. military, is that correct? Yes, they are. Yes, and, and actually there are very few changes that have ever gone into the M2, M2 50 caliber machine gun. Uh, actually, today's weapons have a, a new safety in the back here on, on the back plate. They, uh, so it just has a fire and a safe rather than uh, what a lot of the old military guys would do is they'd put a, a spent 50 caliber casing on the back of the trigger as a safety. Huh. So now they don't have to do that. Uh, who, who developed this weapon, do you know? So this weapon was developed by uh, John Moses Browning and it was uh, adopted into service as a water-cooled machine gun in uh, 1919. So in a couple of years, I believe it was 1921, they came out with the air-cooled version, which is what you see here. And uh, again, just very relatively unchanged since 1921. Fantastic weapon. What do you got next for us, Matt? Next up is our M37 machine gun which is a derivative of the uh, model 1919 A4 30 caliber machine gun. This one was manufactured for uh, vehicle use and the reason being is it was a little bit harder for a, a soldier to be able to reach his hand in here and grab the charging handle. So they manufactured a charging handle here that would, could be pulled back from the rear uh, inside the vehicle. So 30 caliber, which is today's caliber, a 30-06 uh, belt fed machine gun. Uh, again, air cooled. This is a derivative of the a ground uh, model oh, and that's a 30 out six caliber weapon yes sir okay up next up next is our model 1918 a2 browning automatic rifle again designed by john moses browning uh, that fires a the same 30 caliber round as the m37 fires from a 20 round box magazine and uh it does have a uh bipod the bipod was not used uh very much in the uh, early parts of the war, and uh, there, as well as a carry handle. You might see some of those in some of the uh, Korean War films and stuff like that, but uh, for World War II use, this is as you would see it on the beaches in, in D-Day. And this is a heavy weapon. It's very heavy. It's almost as heavy as that 1919. Uh, I would imagine that that bipod only added to that weight. That's right. And so these were infantry weapons, and uh, they were a little, gave the infantry squad a little bit more firepower over uh, over a rather... Uh, regular M1 Garand rifle. It's our understanding that these uh, weapons were actually carried on a lot of the U.S. tank destroyers uh, because they didn't have a bow gun. Okay, fantastic. 30 out 6, Matt? Yes, sir. All right. What do we got next? Next up is our M1 Garand. This uh, weapon is the uh, same 30 caliber as the other two weapons. Uh, it fires from an 8-round N-block clip that is inserted through the top of the action here. Uh, it gives that iconic ping as the last round is fired. So the lets the operator know that he is uh, empty and needed, needs to reload. That sound is not as loud on the battlefield with explosions and gunfire going off as, as one might think, but uh, it's still enough for the operator to know, hey, it's time to reload. Again, a um, pretty pretty hefty weapon. Uh, I guess you could probably use it as a club if you run out of ammunition, right? Oh, yes. <laughs> yep. It's about 10 pounds uh, fully loaded. Yeah. Uh, just fantastic piece of history. 30-06? Yes, sir. Okay, so what we got here is uh, three weapons that were primary U.S. weapons. They all uh, used 30-06 ammunition. Matt had spoken to you a little bit more about American manufacturing. American manufacturing definitely led to us winning the war. And when you take a look at three primary weapons that use the same round, the same caliber uh, round, 
that shows the, the intelligence in planning and in logistics that would only made it more uh, successful, correct? That's right. Okay. What's next, Matt? Yeah, and, and in saying that, John, uh, actually M1 carbine is a good example. Uh, the M1 carbine uh, was developed as a replacement for the Model 1911 pistol. This is a, a 30 caliber design, but it is an intermediate 30 caliber. It's not, the, not quite the same as the other two, other three rifles. Uh, what's interesting, though, know, is these were manufactured by a, a variety of manufacturers. Uh, Inland of General Motors also made them. Uh, there was a several uh, Underwood, which was a typewriter manufacturer, uh, and several others. Um, IBM, Winchester. IBM, that's just, right. Just a lot of them. That's right. So uh, I fired a, like I said, the 30 caliber carbine cartridge the, from a 15 round uh, box magazine. Beautiful weapon. Yep. yep, you'll see a lot of these in the in the vehicle crews and with the vehicle crews themselves, and uh, and also with uh, during infant with infantry uh, NCOs and stuff like that. Fantastic. Here's a real piece of history. This what here, this here is the model M1A1 Thompson submachine gun. So the A1 here is uh, actually a little bit different from the um, uh, the M1 version. This has a fixed firing pin on the uh, base. Made the manufacturing just a little bit easier uh, for, the, for them to make these things. Uh, this one is at 45 caliber, fires from a 20 round, which is what's inserted here, or a 30 round magazine. These weapons were were made uh, in the 1920s, actually, as the model 1928, and then the M1 came out in about 1942, and then the M1A1 in about 1942, 43. Uh, so these these were pretty common on the beaches. They, uh, they had a, a little bit higher cyclic rate than they were actually initially offered in. Uh, the Army wanted a 500 to 600 rounds per minute, and actually when the M1 came out, they were touching 700 rounds a minute. So the Army actually had to get a special waiver to, uh, to be able to manufacture these and sell them, or I'm sorry, Auto Ordnance needed a waiver from the Army to be able to sell these to them. Uh, the M1A1, since it doesn't have the uh, firing pin canal on the inside of the bolt, it's a little bit more solid, so it actually has a little bit slower fire rate than the M1. And this is a very heavy weapon also. You can feel the quality and its weight and its, uh, its reliability. They're, they're much more accurate than I thought. They're, uh, they, they do hold their own. Uh, obviously, being a pistol cartridge, you're a little bit limited on range. Uh, the M1 Garand, like I said, was 10, about 10 pounds. Uh, as well as this. This is about 10 pounds. So, fantastic. Now we have the replacement, more or less, or intended replacement for that weapon. In saying that how heavy that was, the Army wanted something a little bit lighter. So they came up with the M3 grease gun. The M3 is a stamped sheet metal design. Uh, it has a giant bolt on the inside which slows the, the uh, fire rate down to about 450 to 500 rounds per minute. Uh, you'll see this is the M M3 version. Uh, the Army actually even simplified this even more because these charging handles were actually prone to breaking. So this charging handle uh, was done away with, and they put a little notch on the uh, on the bolt, and so it was able to be used to, to pull the bolt back and charge the weapon. Uh, there's no the only safety is is the uh, the port door itself uh, closed. You're not killing. Open. You're killing. So again, nice. 45 caliber. Uh, retractable stock, so they're much more compact. Uh, you'd see these with uh, paratroopers as well as vehicle crews. Now, what's the approximate cost difference back in World War II of the manufacture of a single Thompson versus the manufacture of a single grease gun? And that's interesting too, is the model 1928 Thompson, which was probably the more complicated design uh, and again used to early on in the war, they were about $200 to manufacture. And then when you brought when Savage simple Savage Arms manufact, manufacturing they simplified the process and were able to bring the cost down on the M1 Thompson down to about forty fifty dollars I believe and then the M1A1 was even simpler and brought it down to about forty dollars or less the M3 grease gun I believe was about twelve to fifteen dollars to manufacture wow. so quite the price difference fantastic so. As most tankers wanted to carry a pistol, what do we got here? So the iconic 1911 design, this is the model 1911A1. Uh, there were very few differences between the model 1911 and the model 1911A1. Uh, some of them were a little bit longer of a safety tang on the back here. Uh, some of them had a wide spur hammer, so it was a little bit easier to, to manipulate. The, uh, this one here, again, is a, 
just like the M1 carbine, was manufactured by several different companies. Uh, this one in particular, manufactured by Colt, uh, but you can find uh, Remington Rand, which were typewriter manufacturers, and uh, several others that, that made them during the war. Everybody joined in. That's right. Here we go. And last is the uh, Model 1917 uh, revolver. This one, again, was made by Colt, uh, 45 caliber, so, so again, you'll see a common theme here where they're keeping the, the logistics very simple. Uh, 45 caliber, 30 caliber, uh, a lot of this stuff stayed the same throughout the war so that we had, we were able to get the ammunition that was needed to the troops. This had an interesting uh, feature where it used a 45 semi-automatic ammunition, but it required those moon clips? Yes. Am I right? So, so that was kind of a drawback for these. Uh, without that moon clip, uh, it, you could still eject the cartridges, but it would just take a little bit more effort to, to pull the fired casings out of there. Definitely a heavy weapon. You got you, you really got a piece of meat in your hand with That's this right. thing. All righty. Thank you very much, Matt. Thanks for having me out here. You're welcome. Thank you, D-Day Conniet, and uh, we hope you enjoyed our presentation.